Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are connecting from. Welcome to today's webinar and let's deep dive together into HP's MultiJet Fusion 3D printing technology. All right, thank you for attending. Uh, moving on, today's agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Svetlana, thank you so much for this. This is really a uh, a cool webinar because it's a global webinar. And I actually, um, you know, I had the privilege of uh, um, doing a webinar recently with Zometry Turkey. So I love this idea of just going across the globe, uh, reaching a broader audience, uh, and and also exploring and taking deep dives into new technology. So again, uh, hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Deep Dive into HP's MultiJet Fusion 3D Printing Technology. Um, our goal today is to show you the who's, the what's, the where's, when's, why's, and how's around HP MultiJet Fusion Industrial 3D Printing. And we're going to start broad, and then we're going to work into the nitty gritty uh, with design and pro tips uh, from our additive manufacturing experts. This hour will be jam packed, so we're going to move through a bunch of information. But I do want to em emphasize that we have industry leading panelists uh, from around the globe today, and we love answering questions. Uh, I will repeat that again we love answering questions. Um, we'll hold time at the end for live QA as well as uh, follow up with any additional questions after this event. So please feel free to use the Q&A uh, function of Zoom and, and ask along at any time during this event. Uh, now, we are gonna jump straight into introductions and see you know, who everybody is here. Uh, so my name is Greg Paulson. I'm the Director of Applications Engineering uh, here at Zometry. We're a digital manufacturing marketplace. Uh, in my in my experience over 15 years in advanced manufacturing and additive manufacturing, I've worked on thousands of projects uh, for customers as well as uh, personally uh, in, in a product development uh, career. Uh, so my my experience uh, bridges additive manufacturing, machining, uh, sheet fabrication, injection molding, and much more. Uh, so we kind of have a technology agnostic view about what uh, you know where technologies lie and what can make you most successful with a project. I'm gonna let the other panelists introduce themselves as well. Um, and, and I'm gonna start with uh, um, our very own uh, Nicholas uh, Morongs from Zometry Europe. Hey, Nico. Hello, welcome all. I'm Nicholas Morongs from Zometry Europe. I'm the sales engineer here. Um, in my background, I spent around 20 years in the industry, started in a tool shop in the steel, German steel industry in conventional technologies like CNC and casting that, that over 12 years, then I changed to 3D printing in different uh, roles, different technologies. At least um, my, my former company was G Additive in metal printing in Munich. So since two and a half years, I'm at Summitry and consulting a great sales team and our customers helping them to find the right solutions and run their projects successfully. And I'll go next. Uh, my name is Justin Hopkins. I'm the manager of the application engineering um, polymer side at HP3D. Uh, I've been in the additive industry for almost 20 years. Um, for seven of those years or the past seven years, I've been at uh, HP. Uh, once again, on the polymer side and um, I'm very looking forward today to discuss some different topics about the technology and applications. Um, and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dustin. Hello, everyone. I'm Dustin Klemkin, based out in Boston. Uh, I've been additive for half amount of ju as Justin, so 10 years. Uh, I'm currently supporting the East Coast in Canada and uh, looking forward to your questions. And I see we already have some in the chat. Just to let you know, we will have a lot of resources at the end, so make sure to stay tuned for those. And uh, let's get started. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks so much. And again, this is, you know, part of the fun of these events. It's also planning these events with experts. So um, uh, it's been it's been uh, you know great even working with this team as we've been building out uh, the this presentation for you all today. Uh, I'm going to start off real briefly with what Zometry is uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Zometry. Uh, we are a digital manufacturing marketplace. Uh, we actually serve over 48,000 customers globally and have a digital platform that allows you to get uh, pricing and lead times right away with a with a quick upload and source uh, your, your parts um, very, very quickly. 
And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works in a moment here. Uh, Zometry is also connected with ThomasNet, which is another global supplier directory of over five, uh, 500,000 suppliers. So our goal is to be the first place you go to get custom manufactured parts. And we do it a little bit differently. We're not just you know one shop. Uh, we are a technology-driven platform uh, taking inspiration from other disruptions that we've seen in marketplaces such as travel, retail, payments, and transportation. You can see some of these familiar icons here. We saw that the manufacturing stage was kind of ripe for this. Uh, typically, getting a RFQ is a you know kind of a send and pray uh, experience where you're sending out to suppliers that you may think can do the job, and then you're waiting for quotes back. And sometimes you get those quotes back for the same project, and the pricing is all over the place. Also, for those suppliers, they're kind of getting working with a local to local audience, but they may be the perfect solution for someone across uh, you know across the the country but they may or never have that connection. So how can we bridge that? And what Zometry did was we put AI right into the middle of our interaction. Uh, so we use AI and machine learning. Uh, one, we help eliminate the RFQ process by using computational geometry and uh, interpreting that part on the on that instant that uh, part is uploaded securely to our website. Uh, we'll provide pricing and lead time, uh, even some manufacturing suggestions right at the get-go. This happens in seconds. Like our average quoting time is about 26 seconds versus the multi-day RFQ process you may, be, uh, you may be used to. And we are connected to over 10,000 suppliers. And uh, those suppliers have all sorts of capabilities from multi-jet fusion as uh, professional manufacturers or machining or molding, micro-molding, Swiss turning, you name it, we have that. And we use AI to help match make. So based on your project scopes, we're matchmaking with uh, suppliers who love to do that type of work, matching with that sweet spot and value. And we have a lot of manufacturing capabilities available at Zometry. So from traditional machining, fabrication, um, even formative processes for expanding into production like extrusion, metal stamping, uh, um, we, have that, we have those options for injection molding. And when you look at the little icon there for 3D printing, uh, that fourth one uh, from the top there, it's actually an umbrella. It is an umbrella of, uh, at this point, we're in nine different manufacturing technologies under uh, the 3D printing umbrella or additive manufacturing. If, uh, professionally, we typically call it additive manufacturing uh, because we're growing parts. We're taking from a smaller substrate and making uh, your design uh, go from smaller and fusing in a way to uh, create a larger object. Uh, this includes polymer 3D printing for thermoplastics, uh, resin-based thermoset uh, photopolymer 3D printing, as well as metal 3D printing services. And we have cap capabilities and resources in each one of these verticals is its own webinar or talk or uh, guide. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about that second one uh, from the left here, HP Multi-Jet Fusion. And uh, just a real, you know, real brief there, you could just see some materials and that production and viable is definitely going to be part of this conversation today. And you know, just a reminder, all of this is accessible. Click, drag, upload, uh, zometry.com or in Europe, zometry.eu or zometry.uk or zometry.tk, depending on where you are. But we have, um, we have this ac access to resources for uh, instant quoting, instant buying, and quick parts on demand. So that was my, I'm out of breath. That was my lightning intro to Zometry, uh, but I want to save a bunch of time because we are talking about additive manufacturing with HP Multi-Jet Fusion. So I'm going to uh, pass the baton over to Dustin, and let's just talk a little, little bit about the HP. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. And uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. Hopefully we have some people in the crowd who are brand new to 3D printing, or maybe you looked at it in the past. And so I first wanted to start by reaching out to those people who have maybe tried additive manufacturing in the past and maybe struggled, or maybe this is your first go at it, and just kind of level set where we are in the industry. And so uh, for me personally, having done this now for about 10 years, I get a lot of the same questions over and over again. And so a couple of them uh, I put up here on the screen, and I thought I would just kind of help better explain some of the answers to those questions. So I hear things like many times with many customers, hey, my manufacturing process works fine. Why should I make it any better? Totally get that. Or I've heard, hey, I tried it. Uh, I tried to have manufacturing 10, 20 years ago. 
didn't work out so well. Okay. Uh, I also hear, isn't 3D printing for just prototypes? I, I hear that many times. And then a lot of times people want to know what's the latest and greatest of what's happening. So let's peel back the onion and take a look at some of those answers. So if we first start with, hey, my manufacturing process works fine. Why would I need to make a change? Uh, the best way I can really answer this is if we te kept taking that mentality, we would still have these big boxy cell phones, um, which you know could potentially work fine, but isn't always the best approach. And then secondly, from a competition standpoint, uh, look at Kodak. Kodak almost went bankrupt because they decided not to pivot into digital photography. Uh, so it's really important that you keep an eye on that. Another question I get very often is, hey, I tried additive manufacturing years ago. It didn't work out so well. So I just wanted to quickly go through what HP has been really focusing on with our additive manufacturing technology with multi-jet fusion. And what we're really focusing on is these three pillars, manufacturing predictability, economics, and new applications and markets. And so uh, what I plan to do is just to show a couple of examples real quickly of how this is enabling new outcomes, new applications, and new business models because of this. So if we look at, in particular, manufacturing predictability, uh, we have some newer customers. Uh, one is a boat manufacturer out of Italy, and they're starting to make pulleys out of our multi-jet fusion material, and it works fine for their application. Uh, if we also look into maybe the consumer product space, uh, there's Sing, who's making high-end uh, speakers. Uh, so everything in black that you can see on the right there is printed in multi-jet fusion, and then they have some kind of, I'm not sure if it's a plexiglass or a glass that's actually on there as well. Um, and what they found is because of our predictability and our accuracy, they've been able to get uh, very high profile speakers. If we look at economics, uh, we're able to break into new markets that weren't possible even just a couple of years ago. Uh, some examples that you may have seen recently um, is in footwear. Uh, Dior is starting to explore in that space. And on top of that, uh, ski goggles. So there are a number of uh, ski goggle manufacturers where you can literally take your phone, scan your face, and it will create a 3D model um, that exactly fits your face. And you can actually print lattices that makes it really comfortable to wear when you're skiing. And they're finding that that's economically feasible. And then lastly, if we look at the last pillar here, uh, a couple newer markets that weren't possible, um, either because of materials or what have you, could be in eyewear or glasses, um, or also in cycling, uh, where you can literally get some scans and design saddles that will work specifically for your body. Great. Now let's look at the third question. Hey, isn't 3D printing just for prototypes? Uh, I would say yes, but... And what I mean by that is if we look at a couple of case studies with multi-jet fusion in particular, one of our biggest customers, or actually our biggest customer, is Smile Direct. And they produce the clear teeth aligners uh, that I'm sure many of you got over the pandemic uh, while you were stuck at home. And they have over 40 of our printers today, and they're able to produce more than 50,000 parts a day with each part being unique to that person's mouth. So that's why I say yes, but. So depending on the application and what you're looking for, you could potentially do mass customization or mass mass production with additive manufacturing. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and by the way, uh, Dustin, uh, the, the dental industry is uh, adopting additive manufacturing so much in the industry because you're absolutely right. There's There's no such thing as a repeat order. Like mm -hmm. they're every single thing. Teeth are similar, right? But they're not the same. And so yeah. actually I have one of those uh, little dental. Um, th so this is actually a uh, smile direct will use, uh, will scan the teeth and then create these 
to go through a process where they thermoform the dental aligners over top of them. So each, you know, your, each aligner that you have in correction is a different 3D print. And this allows that that mass configuration and some really clever stuff like, you know, individualization, uh, you know, indication features and mixing, you know, what I love from a design standpoint is you're mixing that mechanical with the organic and you're finding, wow, this is really, you know, this is a, a go-to application here. Exactly. Great point. Okay. And then the last question, which I really like, and I'm sure all the panelists here really like is, what are people doing today with production and additive and what's kind of the latest and greatest? Uh, so this is changing literally by the day, which, you know, I work in this every day and it's hard for me to keep up with what's going on, but it's pretty exciting. Um, one of the more recent examples of, we'll say, mass customization happens to do with uh, wrestling helmets or boxing helmets. Uh, and so what we've done with some of our team internal at HP is we've been able to redesign a wrestling helmet so that it has the same you know, flexibility or cushion like a, a traditional helmet might, but by leveraging design for additive manufacturing principles. And so you can literally scan someone's head, create a, a custom shell that fits their head exactly and gets the right amount of flexibility or cushion right where you need it to be. Uh, so to me, that's something that's pretty exciting. Great. Now let's hand it over to Nicolas and he'll talk a little bit more. Nicolas. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Um, so I like this really a lot. Um, the way of 3D printing. So finally, all of us, we observe it since many years. And also everyone who is uh, working working with this technology or deep in this technology, we always aim to find a kind of, we call, I once heard the name killer application. Everyone who is doing 3D printing wants to reach the point of a killer application, a kind of, I mean, if you say 50,000 parts uh, a day, this is even for me kind of unreal. But what I want to share with you today is an observation um, we made at Zometry Europe in our daily uh, business consulting customers, finding solutions and also um, separate and, and individual solutions for the customers. When they reach out to us, probably they, they reach out with a demand for injection molding. We try to, um, to discuss kind of objective or uh, from, from above to see the cases, to see their demands, to analyze their demands. And then about 3D printing, I think in the last years, it, it changed so much. It changed so rapidly. And even if we are also for, also for me, if I'm in it, I couldn't follow so fast as technology comes up. And reasons why I think that serial production is uh, possible today is the quality of the machines and the print for the first um, got a lot better. But also today we have a post-processing what probably was missing a couple of years ago. Let's say like when, when I saw before HP, we had just SLS and it was, it was quite expensive. It was honestly super expensive. And if you want to have a coloring or a good finishing, um, you can't compare it to the conventional parts. You can't compare it to injection molded parts. But this finally uh, changed today because the offer is really huge on the market. And I want also to share a um, practical case from the last, last weeks, I would say. And we observe that customers more and more decide to choose a 3D printing um, because of the following reasons. They have no tool costs. They don't need to do any uh, design changes in their parts. We can start today. If you reach out to us and your design is ready, you, uh, we can start today. If you want to find out your costs, you can just go on our website. You can compare the different technologies. You can compare different post processes. Mm. And finally, for a big pro project, it's always better to come together and to prepare it uh, deep and really well that the outcome matches also expectations. 
Um, so here, this was a German company. They needed a couple of thousand parts, but they needed them, I don't know, in probably two weeks. It was a German uh, machine uh, building customer. And um, finally, uh, we could deliver the couple of thousand parts in these two weeks and he doesn't uh, have to reduce his demands finally the parts have been in a nice finish they have been in the color he needs them and also in accuracy they have been completely sufficient but you can imagine if you want to do this with injection molding just the design preparation could take the two weeks when he received already a couple of thousand parts and this in, in the beginning, this customer, he was sure he wants to go for injection molding. He even doesn't know that there's a possibility to do stuff like this in uh, 3D printing. Yeah, but I like, I like really to make these kind of cases real and it repeats more often. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I love, I love the, what you're talking about here because it is the aha moment and something that uh, I say, I would say is very unique to Zometry. Uh, because we we are the every shop, right? We have uh, we have a lot of technologies and we have choices. And if you're talking to a molder, all you're gonna it's kind of like you know if something's a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, it's always gonna be a mold project. If you're talking to additive, everything's additive. Uh, and when we when we look at projects, we look at you know what's your scope, what's your timeline, what's your budget, right? And and how can we get exactly. there? And uh, you know that's that's something I actually ran into uh, last year. Uh, you know, with um, with project we did for Autodesk University. So Autodesk University is um, Autodesk's uh, premier event. Uh, it's a it's an in person event, and one of the things they have is something called the factory experience, um, where uh, people that are interested in learning how stuff's made, they get to walk through and put together this super cool gadget, like a you know a thing, and and uh, they get these components of learning how they're produced, and uh, they. And as they go through, at the very end, they get to put it together. And last year's was this smart badge. So um, I have it in my hand on video here. Uh, but this is a this is a smart badge that was designed a uh, little electromechanical system where you kind of interface and and integrate with other badges, share some information across, and you had some interface junctions on the side, um, and you had a, a mixture of kind of cosmetic rigid and soft touch components. So. They came to us, they're like, this is a smart badge. Here's the basic components here. We need 450 sets. So what I call this low volume production. Um, this need to pass what I call the CEO test, which is can you hand this this to someone and they don't break it immediately? Which honestly, some pretty pretty methods, especially resin based, don't pass that test. They almost instantly you know, break when someone's like, oh, I wonder how flexible it is. And then they pop it in their hands in a, in a second here. Uh, the rigid enclosure did have cosmetic requirements, and spoiler alert there, um, based on the design, how it looked, we did decide that at 450 units, it was most economical to build it in injection mold. Uh, but the rubber interfaces, so these unique por portions of this, once we were already molding this outer shell, our budget tightened up from that 8, 9K budget that they had for those 450 sets, and the timeline tightened up too, because each one of these rubber components would require its own mold if we did that. And they also, to Nico's point earlier, they weren't designed yet for molding. So we didn't want to eat up time with a revision. And I can tell you something, 3D printing is very design forgiving, especially uh, technologies like multi-jet fusion. So we had these five unique uh, rubber buttons uh, and these interface uh, features. We need to be, they need to be durable rubber um, the matte finish was actually something they were looking for, which is which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, if we had to make those the unique molds, it just would you know quintuple the budget, which we couldn't do. So we looked at three D printing as a solution. And uh, HP MJF does have rigid materials as well as elastomeric materials like TPU. So this is that little bezel that you see there, and you can see it is a you know a flexible rubber uh rubber material that's very durable when we talk about tpu it's not tpu like it actually is tpu just like your shoe soles so you know very durable material and with 3d printing and mgf you could produce them pretty quickly unlike many uh technologies in 3d printing we're not dictated to a build plate and just a rain on an xy platform you can actually z nest 
and bunch them all together very closely and get that economy of scale. So you get low costs, great components in a timely manner. And within a few builds, we built over 2000 unique parts to complete this project in less than a week. Uh, so it allowed us to very quickly move and adapt uh, and work through and even and uh, and get these parts out on time. So in this project, the success case here was using TPU uh, dyed black, but that helped us, you know, complete the project and also shows how you can mix and match manufacturing technologies together based on what gives you the most value out of your project. So and, you know, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> And so from here, so we've seen a, a few case studies, we've seen some examples, but the one topic that we haven't covered yet is how the technology actually uh, works and the process and the flow of multi-jet fusion. So we're going to take a minute to kind of go through very quickly, step-by-step -step of how that process works. And so multi-jet fusion, sorry, I'm click went too fast. <laughs> See if I'll go back. There we go. I apologize for that. And so multi-jet fusion goes through four steps in, 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 in the internal process. So it's a powder bed fusion technology, uh, which there are obviously other uh, types of powder uh, bed fusion technologies on the market. But multi-jet fusion, um, the first step is you're going to spread out a layer of powder across the print envelope. Um, and that will be spread through a, a roller that moves from front to back, which we'll see in uh, the next slide. Uh, but your second step is uh, really the key to what multi-jet fusion um, process is and the speed in which multi-jet fusion can produce parts, uh, which would be the fusing process. And we use three print heads on our print carriage, which traverses from left to right. Uh, and it disperses two different agents, one being the fusing agent, which is represented by the black droplet that we see here. Uh, and as that infers, anywhere the black droplet is dispersed uh, onto the, the powder, uh, we will fuse the part. And then the translucent droplet that you see is referred to as a detailing agent. Uh, the detailing agent essentially is like for thermal control. Uh, we're going to use it on the inside of the outside of the, the geometry to control the thermal thermal dynamics of the part, uh, which can uh, help with part quality. So you would uh, see less thermal bleed on a part uh, and try to keep that nice and even. Uh, so as it traverses it across, it disperses these uh, agents. Uh, and then at the same time, it applies energy. So on the front and the back side of the carriage, there are two infrared uh, lamps that expose the whole print bed to infrared energy. Uh, the reason the, the fusing agent is a black uh, chemical is because it'll attract more energy in that location, which allows us to selectively fuse the parts in that area. Uh, and notice that I use the word fusing. This is not a binder jet process. Uh, the agents absorb that energy in that location, which brings the, the powder up to melting. Uh, and then we're actually going to melt the part in that location. Uh, during this process, you're going to fuse down through multiple layers of the part, uh, which will, will give you uh, essentially isotropic properties in your X, Y, and Z, which is a big differentiator between other technologies and powder bed fusion. Uh, another thing to note about the process is the speed in which it does it. It's an area-wide pass. Uh, so every single layer, depending on which system it might be, can be anywhere from six seconds to 12 seconds per layer. Uh, and that's regardless of how many parts are on that layer. So it could be one part, it could be a thousand parts. It's always gonna be a static layer time, which then in turn gives you full build volumes in a static time. It, it doesn't matter as Greg showed before, if there were 2000 parts inside of that build, uh, the 5200 series will, um, in, in our PA12 balance print mode, uh, will finish an entire job in 12 hours. Uh, and depending on each material, you'll have different variances in, in build time, but it will always be a static build time for the entire volume. Uh, once it, it, it traverses across, disperses the agents, uh, exposes it to infrared energy, you have that final step where you're going to cover that layer with powder again, and then you rinse and repeat that process over and over again throughout the build. Man, I am not good with the controls today. Um, <laughs> As far as the process seeing it live, uh, this video should automatically play, but it is choosing not to. And there we go. Yes, there thank go. you. 
All right, so uh, from layer to layer. So we can see this is real time. Uh, so that's six seconds per layer that I was referring to uh, will include your spread. So you have from front to back, uh, the material is going to be spread. Uh, and then from left to right, you have the fusing process and it is bi-directional, right? So it can fuse from one direction and fuse uh, repeating back in the other direction. Um, so as it goes through, uh, as you can see, that area-wide pass and that build volume is 15 inches by 11.2 inches by 15 inches high. Uh, and, and additionally, uh, each material will have you know, a different printable area, but that's the full printable area of the volume. So you can put parts all the way up, up to the side. There's, a, there's not a no build zone inside of that print volume. All right, and we'll move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, uh, I think all of us have experience in multiple technologies here. Uh, so we kind of kept this slide open as a quick discussion amongst the team. And, uh, you know, how, how does MJF, so we're talking all about MJF, but how does it compare to other technologies? I know Nico mentions SLS, which would probably be the most similar plastic powder bed fusion technology uh, that we have. But just, you know, in in your words, how do, how do you see this different? Where do you Where do you find the differentiation when you talk to our customers? So from my side, I want I want to mention uh, one point, which I think is uh, quite important, and this is, uh, or even two points. Let's say two points. The one is sprint uh, speed, like Justin nicely explained. So it's unbelievable, like having one layer in six seconds. If you compare this to DMLS, then even half of the time goes for recoating and uh, uh, laser time could be a couple of minutes, depending on the build size, the parts, um, the volume. So this is really various and could be uh, much more slower. But one thing I found out, which sometimes um, covers the demand of the customer, that MGF parts, they have a density above one. So they are completely fused, completely dense. There is no oxygen between the particles compared to SLS this is more than 10 percent more and this could be a lot for some applications yeah and I would definitely lean on that you know the through throughput and how that affects cost we're talking industrial 3d printing so if you haven't if you haven't delved into industrial 3d printing from the audience here you maybe when you think like you know a desktop 3d printer you, you may be like hey that thing only cost me a buck 70 in material that's not quite how quite how it works when we price out on industrial. Um, usually, the overhead rate of a machine is the most expensive portion of your build, usually. And uh, because you're able to increase the throughput, so for example, a typical MJF build is somewhere at yeah, the 12 to 14 hour range. The typical SLS build for about the same amount of parts is going to be somewhere between the 22 to 26 hour range. What that means is, all you know, if you're just ordering quantity one, you may have a similar day one lead time, right? Maybe maybe a day or day difference uh, overall. But if you're ordering a hundred or a thousand, or you're doing a you know a kitted assembly that has multiple components and you're throwing that all together, you start seeing the throughput wins. So the business lead time doesn't creep up over time as much as you would in other processes because you're just pumping out more uh, more output per day uh, with the same amount of equipment. What that means for you and going back to that overhead rate is there's less time spent making your part, less overhead, less cost of the machine. And so, you know, the way that our pricing works at Zometry is essentially you're renting that space, you know, on that machine. We're already, we're always running full builds. So you're renting that space and you get cheaper uh, parts per unit typically. There's some exceptions, especially if you get larger items, and that has to do with build area ranges on different platforms. But overall, usually on you know smaller items like this or like parts that are kind of the size of a fist or smaller, you're going to have a more economical results with MJF. And I just yeah. might add a little bit. Um, you know, I know we're getting some questions on waterproofing and stuff like that. I know Tom has a question on it. So the the thing that Justin mentioned when we're fusing, we're fusing down about ten layers, not just one layer or two layers. And we have more residence time, which is more time for it to kind of intermingle between layers. And as a result of that, a lot of our parts are are pretty much airtight, watertight. 
Um, it does depend, of course, how it's designed. Uh, some mm -hmm. of our thinnest walls that we can print are 0.3 or 0.5 millimeters. Depends on the build orientation. Uh, we also have a design guide on that. So stay tuned for that at the end. But yeah, if you want to do a watertight, airtight application, you certainly can. Um, so that is a possibility with this technology, just because of how the fusing process actually happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great segue actually talking about materials, which is our, our next section here, because there are different materials available uh, under MJF. And depending on what your, uh, what your requirements are, we may lead you in different directions based on what these materials are. So what I have listed here are the ones that we regularly offer uh, through Zometry's website. There are some more variations with TPUs and other uh, other materials out there, but these are these are kind of staple crops, if you will. Um, particularly nylon twelve is the go-to, very versatile material. It's like the if you know if if CNC aluminum sixty sixty one to CNC machining is like nylon twelve to uh, to multi jet fusion. Um, it's just very versatile. Versatile. It has a good uh, blend of stiffness and ductility, uh, which means that yeah, when you hit it really hard, it bounces back to shape versus snapping on you. Um, and uh, and also based on your design and how you design, you could design uh, thin features and get more flexible features. You design ribs or stiffening features, and it acts like a stiff plastic. Uh, so just again, a very very versatile material. Now, if you are looking for something more stiff, uh, we have there, we have a forty percent glass bead infill uh, material, and that that is essentially a mixture of the polymer and uh, 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 glass microspheres, and that gives you a stiffer material. And also maybe better for dimensional stability uh, as you're building larger parts on the platform will typically lean you towards a infill material uh, because plastic, when it's in a heated state, it's expanded. When it cools, it's contracted. And that means when you build something big and broad, uh, that, that thermal wonkiness can actually cause a little bit of deviation, especially designs that look like picture frames is a really good example. And that glass uh, glass bead adds uh, stability and also makes a stiffer part. So if you're looking for something mechanically stiffer, that's a great approach. Um, actually, I'm going to go to my little comparison here. Uh, and you can even see here, like uh, this is, you know, nylon 12, again, that staple, if you think about that purple zone, uh, on this on this graph to the side, you kind of see where that lies versus, you know, glass bead, which is going to have um, uh, more, it takes a little bit more to flex it, right? It's a stiffer material um, and, you know, similar heat deflections, but that's really the, the uh, trade-off you have, but it doesn't elongate as much. So with stiffness usually comes a shorter elongation of break. Nylon 11, I have a little green leaf by this because nylon 11 is one of the few additive polymers that comes from a sustainable resource. Uh, so this is, uh, so nylon 11 is derived from castor bean oil, and it's actually uh, produced uh, in a way where it's a sustainable way of producing that. So it's a renewable way. Uh, and it is more ductile by nature. So the nylon 11, uh, you can see the elongation. Uh, so that big yellow zone on this graph uh, is is more than the rest of those. So it does stretch more. It's not a rubber, but it stretches more before break. Also, usually the stuff that's more flexible tends to be more impact resistant because again, it has a ductility, it pops back into shape. Uh, and and so nylon 11 is good, you know, good if you're starting to add more flexible applications, things that take will take a beating, um, you know, it's a really good op, uh, option to use. Now on the aqueous side, polypropylene, it doesn't want to act with it, interact with anything. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it is uh, hydrophobic, so like it won't absorb in moisture. Um, also very good chemical resistance with very, with those similar properties. If uh, I saw someone's asking about something that's going to be a submersive ap um, application, polypropylene 3D printing may be the way to go uh, because you don't have moisture inf infiltration into the product. And if you're something that's going to take a deep dive, you know, I was talking to someone in a battery application uh, the other day, something that's in a treatment uh, system that's, that's underwater, Polypro may be the best approach uh, for that. It does have, you know, more flexibility, you know, like less mechanical properties than the nylons. But for that, it's just it's just such a winner. And we talked a little bit about the TPU. Um, I do have my demo for TPU though. Uh, that this is chemical vapor smoothed TPU. So that again, this is an HP multi step fusion uh, print. But just to kind of show you, it's not just can it squish and flex, right? But also like can it respond? So I stretch it out, and like here's your ASMR. You know, it just kind of snaps back into place, uh, and that is a 
you know, that is a very versatile material and actually probably one of my favorite 3D printed rubbers that we that we have here at Zometry. That's a again, very brief overview. We have more technical information, data sheets on this, but just kind of showing you each one of these does fit a need and a niche. And as you're looking at your, your application, you know, material can be just as important as your design. And here we are at Pro, um, giving you some uh, design tips, some design rules. So in, in my opinion and uh, most of my um, fellows uh, doing 3D printing, we would say a lot of the success or of the realization chances to get good 3D printing parts depends on design. So um, I, I hear the sentence from Dustin in the beginning from the customer, and I experience this also frequently. The sentence, the customer says, I tried 3D printing, it's not working for me. But why is it not working? And mostly it's really design. If the part is like a super bulky part, you can machine it out of a block, no problem. But please not try to, to repeat this in 3D printing. This would not work. So um, avoiding bulky parts, I would, see, I would say, is one of the um, key um, things here to um, really um, check your check the design of your part to reduce the volume because you have to keep one thing in mind. Volume always, always in every technology, in, in DMLS, much, much more, it means always costs, high costs. The more volume, the more costs you have. And in addition to this, um, depending on the accuracy, volume means deforming. Volume means losing accuracy. So if you could avoid this uh, this point, I think this would be a good uh, start. I mean, still the part could be big, but you can print it hollow. You can hollow the part. You can put a structure in the part. There are so many ways to, um, to really optimize um, the parts to get a good outcome. So we also put you some numbers which are frequently asked also by our customers like what is the main wall thickness the maximum wall recommend uh, by hp because um, another keyword for volume is also heat volume creates a lot of heat and then the process could get in trouble uh, also that's why you need then an advanced build preparation to reduce the volume, to orientate the parts. I mean, this is something we do for you, but still it is a point of uh, project uh, success, I, I would say. So, I mean, in the end, all of it comes together. Um, yeah, so in the end, also, Greg, I think you provided a um, um, good link to mm -hmm. have all the details in there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we can... Uh, we'll we'll go over some resources to find what's next. Uh, it, you know, at the at the very end here uh, as well. So, so um, an another another very important topic I think today's parts are more successful than a couple of years ago is the advanced post processing. So here you see a, a vapor smooth part. Vapor means um, the industry created um, machines for um, 3D printing, especially for the powder beard fusion processes and PA12, where you hang the parts in a vapor machine and a vapor really smooths the surface that it comes very close to an injection molded uh, surface. So here you get not just the, um, the optic um, advantage, you have also a better uh, improved tensile elongation, and um, in general, a, a better performance. And the question uh, before about waterproof, we always we always um, um, uh, say it's better to vapor smooth the part if you need this um, uh, waterproofness, yes, so the the parts get get much more uh, resistant and much more waterproof. So if the design is fine, like Dustin also said, so this, the design plays also a role, then the part could be uh, really water resistant. 
after vapor smoothing in the best case. And here, um, uh, to add one thing, there are also other possibilities. So vapor smoothing for me is the highest grade of finishing. We have also bead blasting means body shot or surfacing, um, which is not glossy, but also a smooth surface. And so I guess there is for everyone something to reach the demands. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, like, you know, we have this is a vapor smooth versus standard dye black. Oh, you just kind of see the sheen of that. So yeah. these are both MJF parts just dyed black, but one has that secondary process. I, by the way, I see a bunch of questions coming in. Um, uh, you know, we'll move we'll move through some of these cosmetic it uh, uh cosmetic uh, um enhancements, if you will. Uh, but yeah, we definitely please keep on asking questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in a few moments. Yep. Yeah, so we'll move a little bit quicker through here. I would encourage anyone, if there's a topic that we've kind of hit on that you want more information on, put it in the chat. Maybe we, we do a reoccurring another webinar on some of those topics that you guys really want to hit in on. But uh, to get back onto this, um, as far as one tip that you can do that really improves uh, beyond vapor smoothing of a part uh, would be applying digital textures to to a additive ma manufactured produced part. Um, and what we see here is four different uh, textures that are done on two um, different parts. And only one of these is actually injection molded. The other three are actually uh, produced on multi-jet fusion. Uh, so that's one of those advantages to the technology. We can get really fine detail with it. Uh, and when you apply a texture to a part, uh, it does a lot for the, the end use of the part uh, that you could actually put it as an appearance side, like inside of a vehicle, uh, because you're going to hide any of those uh, process manufacturing lines that happen throughout any sort of additive manufacturing process. Uh, the same reason you might use it in injection molding, right? You're going to hide seams. You're going to scatter what those manufacturing processes are. Um, plus, it gives a visual interest to the, to the component itself. But out of these uh, four that we have up here, <clears throat> only one of these is actually injection molded, which is the number three here. Um, so just to kind of represent how, how fine of a detail and how um, professional the parts can be, uh, for in-use parts uh, applying through textures. To add on to textures, the other, um, we've done an extensive research on what type of coatings that can actually go on parts. Um, so when you combine that with either a paint or a Cerakote finish, or it could be a dye finish, uh, you really do get that final end-use product that can be customer-facing and not just an internal part. So when we speak to production of some of the case uh, studies that we, we previously showed, uh, you're moving into this direction now where you can actually have it customer-facing as opposed to being hidden, which additive pretty much has been up to date, or an application that doesn't require um, it to be seen by a customer. Yeah, this is this is huge, by the way. And we could talk. This is a sort of webinar just talking about texturing itself, but it is, uh, it is a game changer in almost any additive manufacturing application. If you apply a little bit of texture, uh, you, you basically make the parts more cosmetically viable for your end customer. And so, if you are looking for those class A or you know substitutes from a traditional molding approach, uh, a little bit of texture and that vapor smoothing or secondary finish goes a very very long way. Oops, sorry guys. Okay. So we'll go ahead and just pick up from here. Yep. So what's next, um, at least from the multi-jet fusion side, uh, is the release of our metal printer that happened uh, earlier this year. And that system is called the S100. Uh, we launched the system with two materials up front. They're both steel-based, so we have 3 16 L. Uh, and we have 17.4. Uh, and the, the the reason behind that is that uh, steel is the most widely used uh, material in, in metal. And so, you know, multi-jet fusion or HP really focuses on production. So there's a much larger market to address uh, if we move towards materials that are more widely used in, in uh, manufacturing. Um, and this is a binder process as opposed to what we've been speaking about on the polymer side, right? We're going to use a latex binder. Uh, the, the underlying technology uh, of how it produces the parts in the green state uh, is, is essentially identical to what we do on the polymer side, right? So we have printheads. Uh, we're going to disperse the, in this case, it'll be a, a latex binder. Uh, and then that'll move out and go into uh, depowdering. And then you would go into a, 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 a vacuum furnace 
in order to center the parts from, from there. Uh, but there, there's more information here as you guys get the slides when they're uh, released to everyone after the um, uh, webinar. Uh, you can obviously click on this link uh, and get find out more information on the metal jet. Yeah, and I'm I'm very excited about the uh, the metal jet side. Um, uh, you know, HP does have a track record with making some pretty solid equipment in the professional additive manufacturing space. I got my little metal jet coin right here, and you can kind of see some of that detail that's coming out of the um, you know, the the vertical sides uh, here. And it is, I uh, because if you could think about that X Y Z stacking again, the throughput compared to a traditional process like DMLS uh, is is remarkable. Uh, so, you know, with, with the right technology, it makes metal much more economical, mm. much more viable uh, in a even a low volume setting. All right. So I'm going to, um, I already said, get your questions ready. And also, I love, I see so many questions coming in. So I think people got the point here. So this is awesome. Uh, you know, the last but not least, as we talk through some resources and get into this Q&A, I want to remind you that Zometry, we have a bunch of resources for you. I, and one of the first things I, I want to talk about uh, beyond that is like we have CAD added. So if you're designing an Autodesk Inventor, Fusion 360, Onshape, or SolidWorks, you can go to Zometry.com, click on our CAD add-ins link, and download a free app or add-in uh, that you could use while you're in the design phase. This gives you costing information right away. Uh, it also on the Onshape and Fusion, Fusion 360, you'll get DFM feedback uh, as well. So you can actually see thin wall features, inaccessible gaps, uh, uh, different uh, DFM based on the technology chosen. And it allows you to make those changes while you're still in the driver's seat, right? You, you can actually go verify, adapt, including pricing updates and see how that affects your, your pricing. And we have so many resources. Uh, we'll also follow up after this webinar uh, but Zometry, we no one knows twenty manufacturing or twenty different types of manufacturing back and forth. You know, we don't expect that, but we do have resources to help you learn. If you want to be a pro at MJF, uh, go to our MJF capabilities page. Everything that you see here, everything that we talked about today, we have resources that where you could go even deeper and learn a little bit more, including the links that I have for the uh, the HP side, the handbook that they have, as well as other resources. Uh, actually, Dustin and Justin, I added those a couple of days ago to our website. And uh, so we, we have those actually uh, on Zomtree.com, the capabilities, uh, HP MultiJet Fusion. And if you are interested in uh, talking to Ju uh, Justin and Dustin, um, we have some contact information for them as well. So you can look at Zometry for those parts on the mans, but if you're looking at the equipment itself or specific applications like that helmet you saw earlier, this is the team's talk to. So with that, let's answer some questions. Uh, please you know, copy down this, uh, this, this link. This link is good for uh, both uh, Zometry Europe and Zometry uh, US, but we'd love for you to try MultiJet Fusion and save some money while doing it. So we have a $25 uh, dollar and or euro off uh, coupon code right here and some of our contact information to write. But yeah, um, let's just let's just jump into some questions and, and grab a few to answer what we can. So I'll, I'll jump on the first one there. So someone's actually about asking about FDA and food safe. Uh, on on materials, mm -hmm. so uh, these materials, uh, so these materials do have USP cla class six uh, FDA uh, certification, which means that they don't have irritability sensitivity. They can be used um, uh, in in skin touch applications. Chemical vapor smoothing also helps enhance that uh, because it reduces that surface texture and seals the surface. So chemical vapor smoothing can bring you into a um, help you pass cytotoxicity tests, for example, where it will it will inhibit cell growth or help help inhibit by design. But I will tell you this: food safe is an application; it's not material alone. I can make a food safe material not food safe because food safe is also about accessibility, cleanability of the product, yeah. and its end use. Is it a spoon in my cereal bowl? Or is it, you know, a lid to a mug? There's a very, very different applications there. Uh, but I have a, we have a great guide uh, called Additive Manufacturing Guidelines on Food Products uh, that you can look up on Zometry's website. I'd like to answer a question that I saw. Sure. In chat. Uh, someone asked if we would cover the 5420. Um, the 5420 is a, a newer system that we released that produces white parts, right? When, when I talked about the process of the agents being black, 
uh, we realized the need for, for white parts to be available. Uh, so we produce a system, same technology, different agent that absorbs energy uh, in the IR spectrum that is not a black uh, agent. Mm-hmm. It's actually more of a blue agent, but the parts are extremely white. Sky blue. Uh, yeah. So I call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they have extremely good uh, UV uh, resistance and degradation as far as yellowing is concerned compared to other uh, PA-12 mm-hmm. on the market. It's only available in nylon 12. Yeah, I have a, a question I'd like to answer from Antonio. Antonio from Italy, uh, you're asking about getting good surface finish for the fashion industry. Uh, absolutely, there's a lot you can do to improve the aesthetic look of these parts. Uh, Nicolas hit on some of that from a design perspective. Justin hit on some of that from both texturing and vapor smoothing standpoint. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, a lot of times it just boils down to costs. And I know sometimes in the fashion industry, that might not matter too much. The amazing part about this is you can make some really, really cool textures and parts. And so this is a a feather that I actually keep uh, at my desk that's flexible. And it it gives me kind of design inspiration of what you can do with this technology because it's so flexible. So from an art and fashion standpoint, you can make these amazing parts that are are durable, and then you combine it with a post-processing, you can make just amazing parts. And that's what companies like Dior are looking into with like shoes, like I showed a little bit about. So absolutely reach out to us and let's talk. I want to refer on the question from Jess C. How does MGF compare to DLS in speed quality price for TPU? EPU parts, that means flex parts. And, and just here you can you can really go on zometry.com or EU and you can upload your part and you can compare the prices. It is really nice. But from experience, um, I see that the carbon parts, they are much more expensive. So you can't compare this. They are really, sometimes I, yeah. I tell the customers they are like gold. <laughs> so and yeah just just adding on that so dls is very good if you're um if you're like kind of like he i said rule of the fist like if you have a couple fingers together that that range is usually the size range or smaller is the best application for a dls product and keep in mind you're also a rain parts on a, just a build platform that requires support structure so you don't have that z nesting as well mm-hmm. uh so the there's some fantastic dead-on applications for tls do not get me wrong but they're usually cylindrical or lattice-like structures that are self-supporting in their design, and they're very narrow, so they could array on a smaller platform, uh, you know, in, in sequence. And that is uh, where additive manufacturing with multi-diffusion doesn't require supports. You can throw basically any geometry at it. I'll put some caveats there, but it's very design-forgiving compared to other processes, especially any DLP-style or upside-down printing process. There's a lot of questions. Um, I love these. I love these questions. And by the way, folks, please keep on asking questions even until the very end, because um, what I do is I follow up on our blog post. And I put Q&A responses on our blog post that you'll receive an answer to. So even if we don't answer right now, we will get to that. I'm going to kind of combine a bunch of questions into one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, one person asked about multiple materials. So multi-jet fusion pr- only prints one material at a time. Right. And and within that question, uh, it asked about infill. There's no infill on the process, right? You're going to, you're going to fuse the entire part. Um, And in addition to that, someone asked about the density. Uh, Essentially all of the materials are above one, right? So PA12 is 1.01. So when you can kind of compare that to SLS, uh, typically, you know, they're going to be under one. It's going to be about 0.98. Um, so easy way to check that is take the part, throw it in a bucket of water, water. Yeah. <laughs> does your MJF part sink or does it float? Right. Um, if it sinks, obviously you're above one. Uh, so that's just one thing to kind of put there. And then another person asked about uh, three millimeter uh, shelling of the parts, how much detailing infusing agent is, is used. Um, there's not an exact percentage that you can kind of put on that because the machine actually reads the temperature of the parts and will decide if it needs to use more detailing agent to um, um, cool off the part. 
Uh, so, you know, it, it, you're going to reduce it a lot if you hollow a part out to three millimeters as opposed to being it being solid, uh, which will then in turn uh, help with the cost of the part. Um, yeah. But there's not an exact percentage. So if you use a lattice structure, you may use more detailing agent because you're you're controlling more of that geometry that's on the inside of the part. Yeah. And again, to emphasize on this, and I think a lot of people are also wondering, can I make a hollow part? Uh, because we need to, you know, a hollow part would trap loose powder, unfused powder in it. Um, we always recommend clearance areas to it. And the best parts for MGF tend to be ones that have a quasi-injection mode look, but you can also have cheat codes. This this is a design uh, that a company called Vetivations uses and uh, their their application, right? Cell phones change every year and there's a whole portfolio of them. So they just need a cell phone adapter. So they make specific designs for their for their uh, veterinary ot otoscope project. That's, and this is the additive portion because it changes every year and uh, everybody has different cell phones. Uh, but this is also a good example of talking about detail ag agents because if I took a bandsaw through this, the part will be jet black from that fusion agent. Detailing is kind of that hybridization between the black interior and where that white powder is, which is the raw material used, used here the more kind of ridges and lines and nubs like around this text, you'll see that lighter coloration. Uh, that's, that's you'll tend to see kind of a uh, lighter gray on that, where if you have kind of a consistent, you know, clean overall edge, you tend to see a little bit of a darker uh, feature. So just know like this is, this is something that's programmatic and, and inherent within the process. Uh, if you are looking for color consistency, I, I, you know, I embrace the layers and love the gray. But if you're looking for color consistency, that's usually when you move to a dye part, right? So that's where uh, you could add dye or coloration to it. And again, then you combine dye with, you know, something like vapor smoothing and get those just, you know, remarkably beautiful finishes, uh, as well as enhanced properties. Yeah, to add just a little bit to that, that gray that you just showed was probably a PA-12 part, which is going to have more variation in the tones. If you go with like PA-11 or even PP, it's going to be darker. So each material is going to yeah. have a different hue to it. Yeah, I I, I lost my polypropylene parts around here, but polypropylene tends to have yeah, that darker, co consistent, uh, dark gray look to it for sure. And uh, I'd just like to group a couple more questions as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step back one slide because sure. I know we had a lot of tolerancing, post-processing, how you actually position parts into a build. Um, on the right side here, as Greg mentioned and he put on his website, we have our design handbook, HP MJF design handbook. Um, that is a great resource for you all. We go through a lot of information on that. Um, things that Nicholas covered today and quite a bit more. Uh, we also hit on some post-processing as well. So definitely check that out if you have questions or feel free to reach out to us. And then again, Antonio, you were asking about this feather. Can you vapor smooth it? Absolutely, you can. Uh, so that is the amazing part about this. You can have some really incredible designs and you can do a lot after that if you need to. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, Dustin, I think it's a great way to close the webinar. Is you know, I hope I hope we got you inspired on what multi jet fusion can do. Uh, a little bit more about the how to do that, whether it's design or materials to keep in mind for for this, and uh, and how to source. You know, if you're uh, you know zometry.com, just make it super easy. Like literally in a couple seconds, you'll be able to see your multi jet fusion project, uh, how long it will take, and how much it'll cost you, and press buy. Uh, so I, I want to thank everybody who's attended this webinar, and I want to thank the panelists as well. Like it's it's been awesome to help plan and prepare, as well as you know, a shout out to Svetlana who helped kind of keep us all corralled together uh, for a successful presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you, thank everyone. Thank you all for watching, and please tell us our feedback by answering the survey that is going to pop up now. And just to let you know, this web this webinar will be available on demand, and we're going to send it in an email to everyone who registered. And once again, thank you to all who participated, and thank you for watching. Cheers, you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.